Welcome everyone to a brand new Record Club episode of the Jams and Tea Podcast, where we spill the jams and spill the tea. And this week, we, Riley and I, are coming at you with a new Record Club episode, which is a Record Club, but also kind of a celebration, a bit of a an anniversary, considering this album turns 20 this year. My God, that makes me feel old. Um, but we're talking about All Hail West Texas by the Mountain Goats. And Indeed. it's not just because it's the anniversary that we want to talk about it. It's because I feel like the Mountain Goats are one of the bands that are tied to the DNA of this podcast, because not only did we cover Tallahassee in one of our first record clubs, but we also covered their two newest albums, Getting Into Knives and Dark in here. And when Sersha was still on the channel, she did a great worst to best on the Mountain Goats. So if you're looking to more channel territory discussions of this band this is not the only place you will find it but Mm -hmm. it's remarkable that we haven't actually talked about what many consider the sort of benchmark one of the most notable releases in the band's catalog Mm -hmm. and so it only makes sense i think and we couldn't when i saw that this was turning 20 i was i was really disappointed because it was like we didn't really have a place to fit in a video on this and then Mm -hmm. the space opened up and it feels like it would be foolish to let this anniversary slip without celebrating it in some way. I mean, last Mm -hmm. week, our last record club was also a 20th anniversary uh, album where we talked about Boards of Canada's Geo Getty. So this only makes sense, I think. But for context, uh, the Mountain Goats album, All Hail West Texas, it was their sixth record and it came out in February of 2002, of course. And it's notable for being the final album recorded in what is colloquially known as the Mountain Goats boombox era, which is an era in which John Daniel, usually by himself, but sometimes with company, would record songs sort of directly onto his Panasonic RX FT500 boombox. And that was kind of the creative partner that he had in this era. And, and I use that term because it's something that John himself is invoked when talking about this record. It's notable that this is, I think, one of the only, if not maybe the only album that John recorded and sort of put together completely by his own without kind of outside collaborators in any way. Mountain Goats fans may want to correct me on that, but um, it's very much an intimate record that brings you very, very close to John and the boombox and the role that it plays as the recording device is more important than just this sort of external detail because John actually credits the Panasonic RX FT500 as his collaborator on this album. And you, one of the things that you notice when you listen to this record from front to back is the kind of permanently present tape drone of that machine I think when the album starts like it 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 kicks off and the first thing you hear is this kind of like blast of of tape drone that kind of settles into the background as the song begins you're so conscious every second of this album that you're listening to something that was recorded onto this machine that is barely holding on that barely has a microphone that can capture like the basic sounds that are being played into it And it's worth noting that this is the last album recorded on that machine because that machine was falling apart at the time this album was recorded in the summer of 2001. This machine was on its last legs. I believe that uh, it was already a point where, as John termed it, like the machine would either decide to work or it would decide not to. I think a very apt uh, thing that I found a uh, rate your music comment for this album, which is an arrestingly straightforward lyricist and an ever present drone. That's surely just a result of the low budget, but nonetheless sounds like a constant awareness of death, which is like, you know, you can kind of read that as being semi hyperbolic, but I think that that's a hundred percent in keeping with the nature of the album, just for like how to approach something like this is that, yeah, this recording is like lower than low five, like, It's an intimate folk rock record that doesn't have any bells or whistles whatsoever. And that could be a turnoff, I think, for a lot of people, especially if you're a little bit more familiar with the more accessible records from this band, like The Sunset Tree or We Should All Be Healed, things that are just a little bit more traditionally pleasant to listen to. But I think Riley and I are going to argue that the sound of this album is 110% to its benefit rather than its detriment. 
because it magnifies the intensity and the tangibility of John's songwriting, the characters in the songwriting, and the sense of place that he lends to the songwriting. And that sort of lower fi drone in the background kind of thing, that is the experience that I value this album for, and I wouldn't change it for anything. Because mm. um, if you want something like this, go check out an album like Tallahassee. It has the same storytelling sensibilities, but this album's construction is inherently linked to its identity as being a product of, of struggle. Um, and that's mm. sort of the, the, the tape hiss, the sort of like the awareness of what you're listening to is in fact you know, the lowest five music possible. Also kind of that awareness of death really fits the themes of the album, which are, it, honestly, I remember we talked about this sort of lyrical sensibility when we talked about Dark in here, is that John's lyricism on this album and on that one are about characters who find themselves at a crossroads in their life where they don't really start or end up anywhere. You're just kind of put into it and in media res with all of this songwriting. And it's sort of up to the interpretation of how you listen to it as to who these people are, their stories, and where, most importantly, their stories are going to lead them, which more often than not are probably tragic places. But that's the cool thing about an album like this is that it gives you enough details to paint you a solid enough picture, but also gives you enough tangible details to sort of try and see the song in motion in real time in front of mm. you you can listen to this on one day and have a completely different opinion about a character in it yeah. than you do on another day there's a deliberate ambiguity to the storytelling here i mean john is a master lyricist john is a master songwriter he understands that there is as much power in the information that you leave out as the information that you put in and a lot of writers who don't necessarily understand how to really involve the audience in what they're doing sometimes overlook that which is that if you tell the audience too much if you give the audience too much certainty and clarity about something then they are less involved in it because they are made to like there, there is this distance being put between the actual like realities of the story and you know what's happening in the audience's mind and what i mean by that is that when you leave out certain information that the audience has to fill in the gaps for, what that does is it involves the audience in the story more intimately. And also it allows them to project and put some part of themselves into the story such that every individual person's experience listening to one of these songs is going to be different. They're going to have their own particular interpretation of the things that are ambiguous that can only be a product of their experience, of their brain, of their mind. And that I think is a huge part of what makes John so compelling as a writer, that I think is a huge part of what makes him what has built his audience up over the years because he is so good at writing in that way uh these are songs that as you say jake are about characters who are at a particular point not even necessarily in their entire in the scheme of their entire life but just at a crossroads within the, within this moment in this stage that they're living in where they have the opportunity not just to make the right decision or make the wrong decision but to make a decision at all or to just remain in place there is a sense of possibility of opportunity of chance that these characters have and while there is an underlying tragedy to a number of these stories while a number of these stories do come from a dark place and are embedded within a moment that's particularly tragic or difficult or depressing for the characters or maybe even for the audience there is always a sense when you're listening to the songs on all hail west texas of hope of opportunity of the fact that these stories are not ever clearly restricted to you know being sad sob stories or being uplifting kind of you know, feel good stories either. They're really neither of those things because both of those things are polarities. They're two dimensional. They don't let you get involved and they don't let you feel a sense of reality in the storytelling. What makes John so compelling as a writer is that he avoids and neatly kind of finds a way to duck around kind of these basic two dimensional sentiments. He puts so much detail into the characters of these stories 
but equally as much as he puts detail into these characters to let you feel and understand who these people are he also gives equal weight to the environments that they're existing within as well so you get a really strong sense of not only who the people in these songs are but also their relationship to the world around them and if you're to understand the situations that any of these characters are in you need to understand how they relate to the world around them how they perceive it how they see it and again this is not a matter of spelling out you know didactically or oh, he thinks this or he you know, showing the audience how a person feels, but giving you the information to suggest what the, the feel of the environment is and to create a sense of perspective as well. Some of these songs are in the first person. Some of these songs are in the third person. You get a sense of John overlooking the lives of these characters, but also these characters being a part within John that he uses to channel some part of himself, which is not me saying that these are there are necessarily autobiographical stories on here. We cannot know that. And I think that's the misses the point to try and answer that question. The point is that John channels something within himself, some interest in, or observation about humanity, some desire to understand certain people or certain mindsets, some desire to create some art that will connect to people who know a certain feeling regardless of the context or story of their life that's led them there. And that is really at the heart of a lot of his best songwriting. And that's at the heart of the kind of intimate appeal of all how west texas from a songwriting perspective is that you feel involved and connected to these characters in a lot of various different nuanced emotional complex ways that are the result of how john writes and also how john performs as well and of course as i kind of lead off with the form of it itself the sense that this is one man in a room three components the man the guitar and the boombox and they are all in concert with each other to accentuate these stories i'll want to read a quote from john really quickly uh which is that this is the sound of a long broken machine deciding on its own and without the interference of repairmen or excessive prayer vigils to function again it is a painfully raw sound that can legitimately be thought of as a second performer on these otherwise unaccompanied recordings. It's inexplicable self-originating will to go on echoes some of the boneheaded ideas that motivate the people who populate these little songs. To sort of set the stage a little bit here, I have two things. One is that Honestly, if I can draw back what John's storytelling and sort of lyrical ethos draws from, uh, this is a 100% patented Jake comparison that sort of works, but also not really, is that John writes every single song he's ever written like it's Stairway to Heaven, where there is a purposeful obliqueness about literally everything, but you can identify all of the parts of a specific narrative and you just really kind of walk away from it with your own internal journey contextualizing it and I think it's there's an argument to be made that he doesn't do that any better than he does on this record where the entire encapsulation of it is it's like this is like a Robert Altman film as an album but the sort of monochromatic recording style is like if Robert Altman was also by way of Harmony Kareen like there's such a combo of like the the lo-fi aesthetic and the sort of dingy sort of occasionally like dirty character stuff that's literally like rootsy and like down to earth and also the sort of grand vision of how all of these stories contextualize each other and contextualize that of West Texas, which is not exactly a defined thing, more of an idea. I mean, John humorously wrote All Hail West Texas when he was in like Iowa which is just endlessly funny to me. Um, but I think it no, uh, no better place to start than to get into the weeds with the record is with the first song, which is easily one of the most quintessential Mountain Goat songs. I think this was a record that like, it was most 100% because I encountered this because of Sersha, because she's such a big Mountain Goats fan. This is her favorite album. So when I heard 
uh, best ever death metal band out of Denton, I was just like, oh my God, I listened to this song like two years ago when you like recommended that I listen to it. And ever since then, it's just lied dormant in my head because everything about it rings as completely and wholeheartedly classic. It's the story of these two friends who start a, a death metal band and uh, the Cyrus and what's the other one's name? The other was Jeff. It's like this very, you know, normal starting story about these two kids who start this death metal band and they might be called uh, the, the killers, the hospital bombers, Satan's fingers. Really, really cute sort of almost kind of twee sensibility with the details, but I really love that shit. But once it really gets emotionally involving is that you, sort of the song reveals that they were punished for the fact that they had, you know, satanic iconography and sent to, one of them was sent to a boarding school. And there's a line here that I've all, that has always stuck out to me is like the moment where the album fully kind of decides to hook you, which is, um, uh, when you punish a person for dreaming his dream, don't expect him to thank or forgive you, which is like, that's one of those songwriter lyrics that is like, that's like a Dylan-esque lyric where it's just like, this is a universal truth that evades all context that could change its meaning whatsoever, because this is just undeniably like a fact. And I feel like anyone who's ever written or made anything in their lives that they were proud of can sort of identify with that statement. Mm. And then it sort of doubles down on this with the best ever death metal band out of Denton will in time both outplace and outlive you. So there's the fatalism of, you know, the consequence of one of these kids being sent to a boarding school, but there's the triumphant nature of the fact that it alludes to the fact that they want to get back at these people. We don't know how, but they're going to, they're going to have their kind of teenage rebellious angsty revenge on them somehow. And it's probably going to be really cool or whatever. They're probably going to graffiti the school with the satanic images or something, which, you know, rock on. But there's also the sense that they are the spirit of punk rock is within them so that the the idea the creative endeavor that they've undergone this this death metal band will outlive all of the people who ever doubted them or were their naysayers or whatever it's just like this idea is something that you can never ever take from me and it ends it on like that point right afterwards than the the memorable hail satan hail satan hail satan Tonight. Yeah, you mentioned Altman, and I was, of course, like the short story kind of anthology nature reminded me of Raymond Chandler, who obviously Altman adapted yeah. with shortcuts, and it's a kind of chain of, of influence there. Um, just on the note of that opening track, which you know, obviously I co-signed everything, that was the first Mountain Goats song I ever heard, because this was the first Mountain Goats album I ever listened to. And when you put this album on, and this song starts, and, and it is really a masterclass in how good John is at just intuitively getting you to be able to connect to particular characters within a particular context that you have very limited information about. And he is able to deploy specific details that may be completely mundane, but will connect you and hook you into these kids such that before stenciling their names on their drum heads and guitars that's yeah. always a detail i love such that before you even find out that you know they were punished for what they did you are caring for them you're invested in them and you're concerned about necessarily maybe where the story will go but there's also this sense that again through that outpace and outlive you line that no matter what happens to them and it's quite i think meaningful that the future is left ambiguous for Jeff and Cyrus. And as I talked about before, like ambiguity is one of the big storytelling devices that makes a lot of the songs so powerful. Uh, they develop a plan to get even, but like, as you say, it's not clear what that is. It's not clear how that will manifest. It's not clear whether that will ever happen. And it's important that that's not clear because it, the beauty and the resonance is in the, the will, the desire, the choice to believe like it's it's it, knowing takes that away completely the choice to believe the choice to have that hope the choice to and be able to imagine you know how that's going to manifest like that's where that that's where the uplifting soul of the song comes from i think and that moment in the song where that line comes in when you punish a person for dreaming his dream don't expect him to thank or forgive you like that's another reason why that's so powerful is that 
up until this point, the entire song has just been this third person storytelling, like details about the story that have been laid out to you line after line. And this is a point in the song where that stops for the narrator to actually impart a piece of wisdom on you. So the actual like style of the lyricism changes completely at that point to the narrator no longer speaking, you know, of these um, kids in the third person, but speaking in the second person to the listener and, and imparting this thought on them. And it hits so hard because it's kind of startling that shift at that point in the song and again that's part of why he's such a great writer is he's able to use that to really and it's to make sure that these words which are also beautiful and, and well constructed hit the listener as hard as possible and then with the refrain of hail satan it's like you've taken the entire spirit of the song and you've managed to put it into just this, these two words that say so much and also i think put a smile on your face when you hear them at this point in the song and and because this is the thing about the song that makes it so powerful is that despite the ambiguity despite the the, the oppression these characters are suffering you always come away from the song feeling uplifted i think or at least i do you always come away from the song with a sense of positivity with a sense of i think renewed resolve for yourself and for the world and for jeff and cyrus and all that they represent uh it is an incredible song and i want to again emphasize the fact that john never sees his characters in these two-dimensional stereotypical ways as like tragic figures or as symbols of what blah 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 he sees them as people and they are not destined to or defined by tragedy or by you know circumstance in any way whether it's even if it's positive you get that in fall of the star high school running back the second track on this album where you get i mean john even gives this character a full name in this song william standerforth donahue and this is a character who has this promising career and sports lined up for him but he kind of throws it all away to uh, deal acid and ends up sort of you know in, in a circumstance that maybe is not where he selling wanted to acid be. was the bad idea selling it to a cop was a worse one and the new laws said that 17 year olds could do federal time you were the first one like the the the, the thing about the song that tells you all you need to know about john is that is the way that it ends which is with the line your grandfather rode the boat over from ireland but you made a bad decision or two like he's Ow. never he's never casting judgment on william in any way possible or or kind of consigning him to a certain fate he just made a bad decision or two it's a wonderfully understated and beautiful way of kind of summing the entire thing up and it tells you a lot about the empathy and love and genuine care that john has for the people that populate his songs Oh yeah, that's, I mean, that's a great example too of a song that makes really good use of its very scant runtime is that you almost sort of feel like the brevity of the song is like William Donahue slipping away from you. It's just like, oh shit, he was here and now he's gone. And it's like all of the structures of these songs too is that like, this is like a 40-ish minute album and all of the songs are perfectly paced. You spend just enough time with these people and in this lyricism uh, enough to draw your own conclusions, but also to the point where you almost kind of wish some of them were longer. It kind of like, not that that's like a flaw of the album. It's really more of a feature of it's just like you want, you want to see more from these people because John does such a good job at relaying them to you. Um, a great example of which is one of my favorite songs on here, which is Fault Lines, which is like there's a couple songs on here that are more explicitly about different romantic couples or at least characters that have romantic interest in one another and them sort of being on the move which is another like big theme of this album is characters that are in transit characters that are going places but they there's a, a lack of assuredness as to where they're coming from or even where they're going and whether or not they're going to get there which is all over the record. In fact, it kind of reminds me a lot of uh, The Lonesome Crowded West in that respect. I think that these are albums that share a lot of kinship with each other. But um, on Fault Lines, it's talking about um, this couple who sort of wins a lot of money at Vegas 
and they sort of go off and they just start spending it super frivolously. They buy an expensive car, expensive house, and they just start like indulging in this decadent side of life. And you kind of get the impression that it's meaningful for them because maybe they, they didn't have money like this before. So now they're just kind of irresponsibly blowing it all away. But you never get the notion of that like aspect of the tragedy just because that's a little bit too navel gazy looking down upon people. It's really more you get to enjoy the indulgence with them. The, the darkness in the song comes from the hint that once the money is gone, these two people are going to have a relationship. It's going to start all over again. Like there's uh, the fault lines and the title are fault lines that are being crossed like literally, but also faults within the people who are crossing them. And they're talking about spending and they're talking about like, there's several lyrics on here saying, you know, I have a cracked engine, which is a really good utilization of a double meaning in a song, which you don't really get into like the very end. It's just like, oh, I understand. There's something wrong with both of you. The sugar and the fuel lines line also just sort of alludes to the idea that they're kind of running on empty and that sort of inevitability is going to come but it never arrives in the song so you just get to live with them in this ephemeral moment of joy there's never any like questioning as to whether or not they are not having fun or they're not in love there's never any like it, it's completely procrastinated, like all of the consequences are coming later. So it ends up being this very joyous song, even if there is a hint of fatalism at the end. There's a great point uh, where after the last set of lyrics where he just kind of ends the song with a la la la, hey, hey, which I always thought was interesting because John's not really the type to do that. And honestly, I see that as the extension of the frivolousness of the song being in the frivolousness in keeping with these characters of them trying to draw it out as long as possible. And so John in synergy with these characters draws this out as long as possible until the abrupt ending. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's a really beautiful song and I can't possibly add to it. You've nailed it perfectly. <laughs> One of my favorite songs on the record is Jenny and it, it, it hits a similar nerve for me in the sense that it is, like you say, many of these songs on this record are about these relationships, the exact sort of nature or state of which are sometimes clear and sometimes are a bit ambiguous. And I like the way in which John uses this song to kind of tell you a lot about the two characters in it by focusing in on this Kawasaki motorcycle that the title character, presumably her boyfriend, drives up and takes her away on. And there's so much detail given to this motorcycle. It is, in a sense, humanized in the same way that the characters in the song are. And that's a meaningful uh, decision for a songwriter, I think, because it tells you not only how much this you know, inanimate item means to the two of them, but also how much of a kind of character it actually is in the song and john will do this he will sometimes like the way he will describe inanimate objects will be an almost anthropomorphic he will ascribe characteristics to them or he will describe their relationship with actual people in ways that show you an intimacy that can reveal how strongly people can cling on to items and things that represent you know, a thing that they need, a thing that they want, a chance to get out even. And I think Jenny is a kind of quintessential example of this. How much better can my life get? 900 cubic centimeters of raw whining power. No outstanding mm. warrants for my arrest. And the, the, uh, there's a great little so sort of um, bait and switch that John does in the song where he's like, he's describing this uh, interaction between the two characters in the song. I hopped on the back of the bike, I wrapped my arms around you, and I sank my face into your hair, and then I inhaled as deeply as I possibly could. You were sweet and delicious as the warm desert air, and you pointed your headlamp toward the horizon. We were the one thing in the galaxy God didn't have his eyes on. And what's beautiful lyric. It's a gorgeous lyric. And what's beautiful about that is that the way, so it's what it, an embrace is described in this verse, wrapped my arms around you, sank my face into your hair and inhaled. And 
obviously you assume that this is the central character talking about her boyfriend um but then you get the line you pointed your headlamp toward the horizon which doesn't quite make sense if the you in this question is the human it only makes more sense if the you is the motorbike and then you get then through that line it's revealed that the motorbike is what's being embraced the motorbike is what's being inhaled the motorbike is what is sweet and delicious and that tells you and shows you so much about how this character is clinging to this idea to the symbol that represents their way out in a lot of ways actually it reminds me of tracy chapman's fast car which does a similar sort of thing oh well. yeah um, where, that's a great car yeah where it's like that the idea of the car or the the idea of like the the romantic image of the being in the car and having your kind of head your hair kind of blowing through the wind and that sort of thing is the image of escape is the image of freedom and jake you mentioned that one of the big sort of themes that this album returns to is the idea of being in transit and that i think is really the at the core heart of this album what unites all of these songs whether that transit whether that traveling is actual physical geographical movement or whether it is you know that me metaphorical psychological transit from one stage of your life to another or from one kind of place in a particular scenario to another place in a particular scenario development movement or escape or potentially fleeing to avoid developing to avoid moving it's it's transit and all of the different things that that can represent as a concept or as an idea that comes up repeatedly in these songs i mean the most key kind of obvious example here i think is a song that i think is both is very dear to both of our hearts and one of the most underrated songs in this album which is jeff davis county blues which Fuck i've been yeah. thinking about this um and i i think this might even be a top five mountain goats song for me which is saying a lot considering mm -hmm. i've heard basically all their albums and they have like 200 songs but this yep. is one that's really connected with me in a particular way. And part of it is because it's one of the most minimal and stripped down songs on the record. Uh, I don't just mean musically because they're all minimal and stripped down, but I mean, mm. the there's less of a clear narrative here and more of just these snapshots of a person in motion who has just come out of jail and the always the entire song is like dedicated to listing off these locations and um, highways and details of movement that this person are going through I had no place to go so I drive up to New Mexico fix my eyes in the rear view when I cross the state line and I panic I guess and although it's quite late I take the first exit to 128 I am coming back to Midland and I hope you won't mind Polaroids of the two of us scattered on the passenger seat I drive slowly and evenly and I dream about home oh god that's a hell of a final line for that song and it's Just powerful because ties like, the bow on it. Mm. It's powerful because you've had all these locations thrown at you. You've had this character moving like all over the fucking place. And yet it's never clear what or where home is. It almost feels mm -hmm. as though you almost get the impression that home isn't even a place, but more a kind of abstract concept in this song. Again, this is sort of John's oblique songwriting at its best, the sort of dreaming of home final line there just sort of pulling it all together to be like this is an album that does nothing but get better on re-listen like once you know where everything is headed you kind of appreciate the journey to get there a little bit more and that's 100 percent the case with this song is that the guy here who's obviously fucked up done something spent nights in jail he's got this separation from a loved one and the sort of dream of home you don't really know if he's ever going to go back home or if he can't go back home or if the home is an idealized human idea or a fantasy that'll never come to be. There's just, there's so much density into this song that's two stanzas, honestly. Like th this is why I think one of my biggest bugbears with like albums that we talk about on the podcast or like new records is that with interlude tracks or tracks that are like, you know, sub two minutes on an album is that a lot of them bother me, not even because they're superfluous, but because there is this potential there that so many people like John Darnielle who have been working with very little since the beginning and know how to make their very scant sort of tool shed into the most maximal thing it can possibly be is that there's so much you can do with it. 
And Jeff Davis County Blues is sort of the the epitome of that. And also, in my opinion, at least not really ends off just because I think that uh, Distant Stations is a terrific song, too. But it's immediately preceded by three songs that I think that you and I will both 100 percent go to bat for. This is one of the best strings of songs on any Mountain Goats album, probably any album, really, just because I think these are like all perfect, starting with um Pink and Blue, which I know is a song that you have a real affinity for, but the song after that, which is probably an incredibly lukewarm Mountain Goats take, is that Riches and Wonders is 100% one of my favorite songs on here. One of my favorite songs the band ever made is that this is a great song for a lot of the same reasons that Fault Lines is too, but there's something like, there's something different about it because the, you don't really get the sense of like impending foreboding doom that that other relationship is headed towards you sort of get the idea of a quiet discontent within a very humble and like a relationship sort of normal and full of humility in that like there are so many cute little details of like that I learned foreign and exotic terms of endearment by which to address you which is one of my favorite lyrics he's ever written to just because you completely get the idea of who this guy is or who this woman is just by that one little detail alone but um there's so like it also kind of reminds me of songs like on Tallahassee game shows touch our lives where it's sort of the embracing of the mundanity of everything but also the acknowledgement that things could be so much more than they are but the final bit of like stanza here is that it's you know and I keep you safe from harm you hold me in your arms and I want to go home but I am home and you sort of get a dissonance in those final lines of just like yeah there's no other place that this person wants to be other than this other person's arms but at the same time there is something about that that still leaves them wanting that leaves them with a certain amount of emptiness because like you know I want to go home but I am home it's like a really it's almost a really really dark lyric that comes at the end of a song but it's like does that mean that perhaps maybe that they just want to be elsewhere with this person or is it an acknowledgement that even when you find someone that you love that you devote yourself fully and wholly to and you find uh, a beautiful almost like coen brothers-esque existence uh, with them i always imagine couples that are in like raising arizona or fargo to be like the subjects of these songs and the darkness here is that it's just like even if you find that relationship even if you find that person there still could be some part of you that is not going to be fully satisfied or Mm -hmm. it's not just a one you know one size fits all this is all you know fine everything's perfect now which is really really dark which should demean its power as kind of love song but doesn't because it's a human sentiment it's a fallible sentiment it's not one that's like you know, this grand statement. It's like, it's not like a no children style thing, which even has its own context within its album, but it's, it's a little bit less than that. And I think the mess inside kind of beautifully leaps off of that in the same, very similar way. There's a lot of really, really specific different locations that are referenced here, kind of the epitome of the traveling song, the sort of restless nature of every character and theme, the sort of the, the end stanza, which is a little, it's very similar, The but I cannot run and I cannot hide from the wreck we've made of our house and from the mess inside, which obviously double meaning, but it's also, again, you you feel like this is kind of a companion song in the sense that like this mm. is the darkness at the end of the other one yeah. blown up to a larger degree. Well, it and, feels like a progression you, from that song. Like these two songs feel like they could almost be about the same couple at different yes. stages and they're falling apart. One thing I've always loved about Riches and Wonders and I'm just putting my literate analysis hat on is that so this is a song that uses a lot of imagery that suggests kind of living in extravagance and living in luxury we live high our love gorges on the alcohol we feed her and it grows all fat and friendly um we are filled with riches and wonders our love keeps the things it finds and we dance like drunken sailors lost at sea out of our minds like it gives you this sense of like you can tell that this is all sort of meta, like these similes and stuff are all kind of just like, it's all exercises and words to suggest like a kind of uh, extravagance to the height of their love and to the things that they do. I mean, you might see them as a similar sort of couple to maybe the couple in Fault Lines as well who are going and gambling and all that mm-hmm. sort of thing. But that is what makes 
the I want to go home, but I am home thing hit so hard is that it's such a sharp contrast with the way that their relationship and their actions are described in the rest of the song. And it kind of suggests this fundamental truth, which is that no matter how many things you have, no matter the riches and wonders that you possess, no matter the things, the, the, the physical activities and objects that you find uh, communion and, 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 comfort in like they cannot necessarily they will not necessarily protect you from an emptiness that cannot be resolved other than by communication and through people and that's a, a powerful and kind of upsetting and gutting but fundamental truth at the heart of a lot of these songs on the record as well I mean it comes back to Jenny where it's like this absolute fixation on the motorbike as a way of avoiding confronting the fact that you know, what the motorbike is doing is it's covering up some deep seated hole in you that you that you don't want to think about having to deal with. And yeah, that's a state I think a lot of the characters in this album are in. And even then the mess inside as well. I wanted you to love me like you used to do that refrain is describing like this person's kind of um, you know, part sad, part even pathetic, like wanting, but it is a kind of fruitless, powerless wanting. It is a kind of yearning, a pining that will never amount to anything because it's not being actualized in any way. Actually, it's interesting that the, the lyric is written, I wanted you, like in the in the past sense, in the past tense, almost as if like this character is reflecting on something that has fallen apart that he's almost acknowledging that this person will never love him like they used to do but all they can do is describe that pathetic feeling that they once had and it's it's yeah I think in a lot of ways it's in terms of the, re the relationship songs in this album this is the one that uh, is maybe the most gutting in that sense and the most maybe uh, familiar to fans of, of records like Tallahassee it's it's also like one of the only romantic songs on here that's not focused in living in the present. It's a song that's very much stuck in the past and by extension creates anxiety about the future. Whereas the other songs like Fault Lines are literally about living in the moment and casting aside all of those other things. And there's no, and again, it's like John's sort of unbiased perspective there. Is it like, he's not saying that one's better than the other because one has a more probably healthy perspective and outlook that's more reasonable, like as a person to have. And yet the other one is the one that's full of warmth and full of joy and full of wonder that, yeah, it'll, it'll end eventually, sure. But don't you want to enjoy life while it's happening? Yeah. And it creates a sort of dichotomy between these two things that doesn't like lead to these being repetitive. Yeah. And like you can see how that if you see the mess inside as a continuation of the story of the characters of Riches and Wonders, you can see Jeff Davis mm -hmm. County Blues as a continuation of the story of this couple, except this time it's just this one person who, again, they were reflecting on what they wanted. And it's clear from the mess inside that that other person is no longer you know in their life maybe they are physically but certainly not emotionally or psychologically um but although also like it actually does the more i think about it I, i'm pretty convinced that in the mess inside that that person is not in their life anymore and then jeff davis county blues you have that line of like polaroids of the two of us scattered on the passenger seat like this distant kind of echo of that person that will never leave their mind, you know, the dream about home that I talked about earlier. And I think that even continues into distant stations as well, which yes. is a song about pining for someone that you can't see or you can't be around or you can't access for whatever reason, uh, trying to like uh, reconcile your feelings and reconcile the profound impact that someone has had on your life when they cannot be in your life anymore or maybe at all I, it's only just hitting me now as we discuss that that you can read that stretch of like five songs as uh, or four songs as a continuous story in some ways uh, it's I feel like you can do that with like 
most of the songs on here, if you try to play Legworth enough, like even something like Jenny, I almost feel like that could be the inception of the relationship that's being talked about later here. And when we speak to that, we're not necessarily saying that this like is a concept album or a narrative. It's that John's writing is so versatile is that it works in and of themselves, but it also works as a cohesive flowing statement that can be an, you know, an analysis of the entire breadth of this relationship but also in the respect that it could be, it's so multifaceted that it can't really just be about one human being's experience. And honestly, I think this continues into a song that admittedly took a long time to grow on me. I kind of thought it was one of the lesser ones um, on the track list, but one that I appreciate, especially for its placement after this sort of run, which is Blues in Dallas, which is a song that's just purely, it's maybe the, the, the least restless song on the album but it's purely purgatorial like instrumentally it basically has the only other uh present idea on it is that you can sort of hear the preset on the boom box doing this really kind of like burr, burr, burr. but combined with the lyricism here it's like being stuck in uh, a, a waiting room forever waiting for that special someone that you're like either attracted to in love with or just like waiting for a second chance for and again there's never any hint that this person is going to come around for person they're just saying i will stay here and i will wait for you down in dealey plaza he will just wait he will wait he will wait and it's just sort of burrowed into your head and it's just like the more i think about it the more i'm just like oh god if this is a follow-up to jeff davis county blues fucking like oh kill me <laughs> shit <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, it's a perfect point, I think, to talk about my favorite song on the album, which is the very mm -hmm. next track, Source Decay. Uh, this sure. is a song that, again, it's like reflections on the past, but the way that John describes in such beautifully intricate detail the nature of this character's nostalgia is so vivid and evokes such clear images and a clear sort of psychological connection from me to this character that it's profoundly moving and, and deeply, deeply emotional for me to listen to. What I like about it is we get this sense of a continuous experience this character is having and like a diary entry that they're kind of telling you about the things that they do their patterns of behavior their schedule in terms of the parts of their life or the parts of their day where they devote time to this nostalgic longing for this past and that sense of wanting to linger in something that allows you to feel comforted that allows you to feel like you can escape from the moment and the present is is beautifully beautifully encapsulated in my favorite lyric on the album which is i wish the west texas highway was a mobius strip i could ride it out mm -hmm. forever when i feel my heart break like that desire to just again it comes back to that theme of being in transit that desire to be in a state of constant motion uh, so that you don't have to deal with any of the things that come flooding toward you when you are still. I think that John here taps into a fundamental psychological phenomenon as well that we all experience, which is the desire to move. Like I think that um, any way you want to interpret that uh, in terms of what movement re represents in this play in this um, in this state. We all have a desire to not be in the same place for too long. Like if we are in the same place for too long, we get this itch, this desire to move because being in the same place for too long can in some way, whether implicitly or explicitly to us, represent imprisonment, being trapped, being stuck to a particular moment, like a lack of agency, which is why I think we always have the desire to move in some way after a certain point. And John taps into that innate psychological phenomenon to use the transit metaphors and to use those um, songwriting techniques to allow you to connect to these characters. Because on a fundamental level, like regardless of your familiarity with the specific situations depicted on these songs, which again are often more ambiguous and vague than clear, regardless of that, you will be able to connect to that feeling of 
needing the freedom to move and of needing the agency to be able to define your own life and define your own path. And that I think is at the fundamental core of this entire album. Yeah, I think the the exploration of like the inherent anxiety of the human experience is found here. And like that Mobius strip metaphor is at its most potent because it's the simultaneous exploration of moving, but without actually like getting anywhere. You're you're stuck. You're you, there is motion, but there is not exactly a distance traveled. Like you're it's almost like a form of delusion that you're trying to like sink yourself into to just be like, this is enough for me. This is enough for me. And some of these songs are an exploration of that. And some of the songs are an exploration of being at your breaking point with that. It's like, maybe you've done that for 10 years and you're suddenly finding yourself wanting to distance yourself from it, but it's just an infinite loop that just kind of goes and goes and goes and goes. And that sort of implication from this experience is so fascinating and kind of like high concept in that this is just the, again, it's a testament to John's abilities as a, as a craftsman, as a storyteller that you take all of these tiny itty little bitty things and it's really just from his mere presence alone that all of these lofty ideas are invoked yeah. and that's kind of what makes him and the mountain goats really special as a band and as a creative force is that I don't really know of many other artists that do that and if they do they don't really do it in the way that John Darniel does like mm -hmm. I mean I, I've already made the comparison multiple times, but if this generation of songwriters needs a Bob Dylan, he's it. Yeah. My, um, my favorite detail of this entire song uh, is you have this lyrical motif, this refrain that rounds out each verse. I remember the train headed south out of Bangkok down toward the water. And when you first hear that, um, because it's said three times in this song, when you first hear that, of the 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 implication is this character is you know kind of clinging to this memory of being on a train and moving away from Bangkok and moving away from the city and and moving towards the water and this kind of idea of being in motion toward an escape that's the image that's invoked but then at the very end of the song the last time it's said it's preceded by the line I think about a railroad platform back in 1983 and I remember the train headed south out of Bangkok down toward the water. And that completely recontextualizes it because now the character is no longer on the train moving. The character is on the railroad platform watching the train disappear from view, stuck in place. And in the context of the song where he's pining for patterns and signals and ideas that could tell him about this person and where they are and how they might be able to get back into their lives your life that idea of standing on a railroad platform in the distant past and watching a train kind of fade from view is devastating because all of a sudden it's not our protagonist who is escaping it is our protagonist who is watching the person that they were once so connected to disappear from their life and disappear from view as they get to travel as they get to move away and he is stuck in this one place in this mobius strip of a location and that is why it's a masterclass of a song that's why it's my favorite song on the album because it's the kind of thing that john is so good at doing across a number of these songs but it's never done more poignantly to me than right here it's just one of my favorite songs of all time i think and then the album ends with absolute lift ups effect which is an interesting choice for a closer uh this idea of uh, it, it has a sense of finality to it. It is like after one long season of waiting, of wanting, I am breaking open. And I talked earlier about how John gives a certain level of detail to the environment and to the aspects of nature that exist in these locations as he does to the people themselves. And that's super important, right? For you to understand a person, you have to understand the place that they exist within, their relationship to the wider sort of natural organic world that we're all a part of. And this closing track is an interesting way of kind of emphasizing that because here you have a character who essentially like uh, in Franz Kafka style kind of like seems to transform into a plant, mm -hmm. uh, seems to kind of just leave their form and become this 
Uh, and obviously, like it could just be a metaphor, like I will bloom here in my room with a little water and a little bit of sunlight and tender mercy. But John, I think purposefully, really strongly invokes the idea of this person being this plant. I am breaking open. My insides are pink and raw. Uh, it, it's a really potent way of ending the album in a way that suggests that there is this ultimate communion this person is able to find with the entire world around them that allows them to be everywhere at once, that allows them to exist in a state of perpetual freedom, so long as there is the sunlight and the tender mercy of a god or of uh, some, you know, uh, fundamental... Whatever thing. allows him to exist. Yeah, exactly. So long as that is there, there is uh, a freedom within that will, if you can access it, will will mean you never feel trapped ever again. And that is, I think, a really hopeful and beautiful note to end the album on. It's, and I, I only usually take away this as being something that I come down on optimistically, but even so, there's still a versatility to the writing here where almost like the transformation into a plant, it could be seen as some kind of death, but I feel like even if it is, you know, more symbolic of someone, you know, dying and then becoming the earth, uh, John still ultimately sees that as something that is worthwhile and something that is good is becoming, you know, a part of the environment and finding solace in the worst possible fate you could be confined to is you know, making these little steps in this progress, but still ultimately finding yourself uh, in the dirt and dead. But there is a sort of connectivity of the entire experience of everything that's ever lived that you can join in on. It's the fucking circle of life, but in the final track of the song. Yeah, fuck, fuck. <laughs> and that's the album. This I album's mean, good, shit. I mean, this is why, I mean, it's been 20 years and it's resonated so much with people no matter how far along within that timeline that they encountered it. I mean, this album has been in my life for, I think coming up on 10 years now. And I think it's been in your life for maybe like just over, uh, not even two years. Uh, correct me if I'm yeah. wrong there. And yet we both have this- Obviously it's of, meant something. <laughs> We both have this sense of connection and having lived with it that's allowed us to come to this point and and speak about it and yeah and and, and that's why i think it's important to celebrate when it has a milestone like this because the mountain goats may have come so far john may have come so far they may have gone through all of these different sounds they may be light years away from where they were here at this point in time and maybe some fans you know don't enjoy the more recent material as much because of that i love it personally i think the two the 2010s material from john has been in a lot of ways some of the strongest he's ever done but this album will always be unique and it will always be a pillar within this wider tapestry of the mountain goats it will always have this particular special energy that no other record has not even the other boombox records because this is such a concentrated and refined collection of songs within their aesthetic that it's the ultimate apotheosis of that mode of the of john's career so yeah it's 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 a masterpiece what else is there to say yeah, I mean, it's just the the album that defines the most, well, the album that defines debatably the most important sort of development stage in this band's life, because you sort of see John coming into his own as a storyteller, as a lyricist, and even as a musician, and then it's this album, it's at its highest, and after you get through this you go through all of the albums that are you know more studio albums that rely on sound and instrumentality in a little bit more of a uh, refined and traditional way but even 20 years later this is an album that still is comparable to the best of that work and that's a testament to like lo-fi music in general and that it still has a place even though we live in such an immediate and technologically advanced world now. Mm. Shall we do our favorite tracks and ratings for All Hail West Texas? Yes. Jake, why don't you lead us off? My three favorite tracks, I'm going to say, got to shout out the underrated Jeff Davis County Blues, got to give it up to Riches and Wonders, and I'm probably going to co-sign and say that Source Decay is one of the best on here, uh, leaving out a ridiculous amount of perfect songs, in my opinion. Sorry, best ever death metal band out of Denton, Pink and Blue, Mess Inside, love y'all. 
Um, but uh, least favorite song is probably uh, Color in Your Cheeks, which is a song that we didn't really talk about. And I think that's kind of emblematic as to why it's my least favorite is that it's still a good song. It's one of the most musically spry things on here. It's very catchy. But when it comes to the story that's being told here, the story of like, at least the way I see it, uh, sort of somebody who runs some sort of like bed and breakfast type deal and all of the different people who come in who they see who they offer drinks to it's a it's an interesting portrait of the environment but it doesn't have the vitality and the overall sort of um the perspective that I find so interesting and valuable and versatile about the rest of the songs here it's still an enjoyable song but it's the one I personally get the least out of and I would give the album a 9.5 out of 10. Excellent um my three favorite tracks are source decay um pink and blue which i also didn't really i forgot to talk about but is a beautiful song for reasons that i've also articulated on a lot of other songs in this record and third place i will pick oh man what am i going to pick for third place um i'm going to say riches and wonders because that song has always meant a lot to me as well and it fucking guts me not to put uh best ever death Noel band out in there as well uh my least my least favorites my least favorites probably blues in dallas and i'm gonna give the album a 9.5 also so that is an average rating of 9.5 for the mountain goats all hail west texas but we want to hear from you at home. Let us know what you think of this album. Let us know what this album means to you. If you're listening on Spotify or Apple, hop on over to our YouTube page, jump in the comments and leave us a comment on what you think of this album. We want to hear your opinions. We want to hear your perspectives. We want to hear your journeys with this album because it is such a personal album. It is such an album that's so defined by the connections that you make with it and the experiences that you have while it's in your life. So let us know in the comments what you think. Uh, If you're listening on Spotify or Apple uh, and you enjoy what we do, please give us a five-star rate or review. That may not sound like much, but it actually gives us a huge boost in terms of getting attention to our podcast. If you're checking it out on YouTube, hit the like button if you liked, hit the subscribe button if you have not already as well. Both of those things do us a huge solid, like I cannot emphasize how much they help. And if you want to go the extra mile, if you really like what we do and you want to become a supporter, you can hit the join button on our YouTube page. And for just $1 a month, you can support the channel and get yourself entitled to certain perks, such as having your name put in the title crawl of every video on this channel, getting a priority comment response. And if you want to give us a musical recommendation to listen to, if you're a member, then your recommendation will go to the top of the pile. So there's that as an additional option as well. And yeah, until next time, rock over London, rock on Chicago, Panasonic, a better life, a better world.